Welcome back. We've now got um, three re really important sessions um, in a row. Um, and to start off with, uh, we now have a session on uh, copyright and the creative commons, which I think is very timely because we've touched on the issue um, of copyright licensing and associated issues on and off through the day so far. So it will be great to have clarification on that. And we're going to hear from uh, uh, Ben and Jocelyn um, in reverse order on the program. It's going to hear from Ben first. Um, and uh, we suggest that they're going to make their presentations back to back so that they give us a, a good bit of content. Um, and then some time uh, at the end for some questions and points on clarification. So Ben, would you like to start us off? And welcome. Okay. Often these mic stands are not built for people that are six foot two. Can you hear okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Ben White. I've got a background in rights and licensing, first of all, in the publishing community. I used to work for Pearson and Longman, and more recently, as you can see, I work for the British Library. Um, and my job here is mainly to uh, license journal content um, and, and also do what, what we call licensing out, which is public-private partnerships um, in and around public domain content. Um, I've been asked to give a presentation really um, kind of a ladybird book style uh, to introduce cop the very, very, very complex issues of copyright law and licensing in 10 minutes. <laughs> so, um, so really, um, those, those of you that don't know about copyright law and licensing live, live a very blessed life. Um, <laughs> It's, it should be the plumbing that just sits or the wiring that sits in, in the background. Um, sometimes it is, and that's the great times when you just don't know that it's there. And sometimes, as we've seen um, in and around open access, particularly in the journal um, world, sometimes it becomes some, somewhat controversial. So my presentation is really, to, as I said, to um, give a Ladybird book style uh, introduction to copyright law and licensing. And then, um, given that I'm up here, I'm also just going to share with you two things that came from an interesting conference that I went to recently, uh, in, uh, which was the Society of Scholarly Publishers Conference a um, num number of weeks ago, where they were talking a lot about open access. So the basics of copyright law, copyright law sits with the author. It's automatic. It doesn't need to be registered just by... Uh, creating, fixing uh, an idea, a, a creative act in, in, in the form of text or a sound recording or a film copyright is created. And it lasts for book authors, for example, for life plus 70 years. Um, and, and academic authors, I think, are in a rather interesting position that um, whereas the, the slides that I'm producing, to the extent that there is some skill, labor, and judgment, therefore creativity in them, um, they don't belong to me. They belong to my um, employer. Um, academics, in the, certainly in the UK, that generally isn't the case, although they're employed by the university. The copyright law generally, um, I believe, sits with uh, the, the academic author. So um, you're Academic authors are in a rather privileged position, I think. Um, since 1988, UK copyright law has also um, given these things called moral rights, and moral rights are um, essentially the right to be identified as the author, um, to not be misattributed, i.e. to be attributed correctly, and also, uh, which is extremely subjective, also gives you the right to object to derogatory treatment. Um, so, so, again, moral rights, this, this sort of post-1988 continental European in origin um, idea essentially um, really gives you the right of attribution as well as to object to incorrect or derogatory treatment. UK law, along with other uh, common law jurisdictions, to my knowledge, allows you to lend, sell, waive, and give your, your copyright away. It is, in a sense... Uh, exactly the same um, as, as property in that particular sense, that in, 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 in common law jurisdictions you can essentially do what you want with it in the way that you can do what you want with 
um, with physical goods. Uh, continental jurisdictions are, are, are slightly different, um, but uh, sen essentially in the UK you can assign your copyright or you can, you can, you can lend it for, for a defined period. Copyright law talks about exclusive rights. It gives the author, the creator, an exclusive right of ownership on the product of, of their intellectual creativity. Um, an exclusive right, another word for that is a, essentially, um, it's a kind of a de facto monopoly, perhaps. Um, but actually, very few, if any, um, jurisdictions globally give absolute control to authors and create creators. There's a balance between the exclusive rights, these monopolies, and what are called exemptions or limitations and exceptions. And certainly in the educational sphere, in the academic sphere, these exemptions are pretty important. They allow things like copying for research purposes, um, they allow criticism and review when you're reviewing or writing about other people's works. And, and, and pretty important to um, scholars in the humanities and social sciences. This was a review undertaken by the British Academy seven years ago. And it's quite interesting if you look at um, the, the results of, of, of the work that they did working with scholars and academics. And it basically said that, um, particularly in the humanities and social sciences, authors were were rather confined and, um, and, 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 and felt that the limitations and exceptions, the exemptions I just told you about, were being defined too narrowly. That when they were wanting, particularly for criticism and review purposes, to use other works, other in-copyright works, that the rights holders and or the publishers were being too restrictive in terms of what they were allowed to quote, how much in terms of quantity they were able to use. So I, I, you know, I, a large audience, I'm sure you'll be thinking about um, the issues that are raised in very different ways. But I think this study is quite interesting from humanities and social science academics where they, they, they essentially said that they were frustrated with um, the way that existing limitations and exceptions were being narrowly um, uh, drawn and therefore that was limiting upon their ability to reuse works and, 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 and therefore to kind of progress learning and scholarship. So, um, and obviously this is something that open forms of licensing deal with very nicely. Licensing. Um, it's quite interesting. I tried to look for some, some surveys or studies on what sort of contracts authors are signing. And I don't know if it's because of confidentiality clauses for business sensitivity reasons, but it's quite difficult to find any study on this, certainly for monographs. This is one study I did f find from ALPSP from 2008, which essentially says that 74% um, of authors, journal authors this is, um, should or, or, or commonly assign their copyright outright to the publisher. So that means that they give their copyright to the publisher in order for the publisher to, um, to publish. And as I said at the beginning, uh, that means that the copyright doesn't sit with the author but with the publisher for life plus 70 years um, unless there are some other clauses in, in, in the contract which in some way ameliorate that, that assignment. Um, last Thursday when I was thinking about this presentation I took a very interesting um, voyage down the imprint pages of lots of books that sit on my shelves in my office and um, it was quite interesting looking at the monographs and where, where the copyright sat. And essentially, I think, I think monographs is, a, is, 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 f is far more gray than, than journal publishing. And, it, and there was a real mixture. Some of the, the books copyright sat with, with the publisher, um, generally the larger publisher. And again, to, to um, generalize horrendously, it seemed that the smaller the publisher, um, the the copyright then sat with, with the author. Um, but there are different ways. Licensing is, is very complex. As I said, at one end of the scale, you can assign your, your cop 
copyright or copyright was traditionally assigned to the publisher outright. And in that instance, you as an author would, know, would have no further ability to use the, your own work other than what copyright law, i.e. the limitations and exceptions, allowed you to do. Um, another model common, I think, is to assign rights to the publisher for time limited or period only or for a certain print run, and then the rights revert back to you. But as I said, licensing is very complicated and you can really kind of cut and dice this any which way that you want. Creative Commons licenses, as I said at the beginning, my job is licensing. Um, to me, a Creative Commons license is um, perhaps better than many other licenses because they're only two pages. Um, many of the licenses that I see are kind of 15 to 20 pages, so um, I do kind of like them for their brevity. Um, but as a, as a licensing professional, you know, I understand and interact with a Creative Commons license just in the way that I do with any other license that I get from, from any other publisher. And I recognize things in the Creative Commons licenses that, that I will see in the 15, 20 page horrors. Um, and again, you know, they are durations of copyright. Creative Commons licenses build on that. Um, moral rights attribution is, is always dealt with. Uh, Creative Commons licenses are um, excellent in the fact that they uh, allow limitations and exceptions to be used, um, something that, that we see to varying different um, extents as a li library, certainly, from the large licenses that we get from large publishers that, that give certain rights but don't generally allow all the limitations and exceptions that you would see in UK law to be exercised. Um, and Creative Commons also deals with commercial, non-commercial use, derived use, et cetera, et cetera. And they have a great advantage in that not only is obviously if the material is openly available on the web, the text can be discovered, you can also do a search on the license. So something like half a billion works are available um, to be are indexed by search engines. And for example, if you go on a search engine and put Creative Commons search engine, you c come up with a search engine which allows you to search on material um, that's available under a Creative Commons license. So there's kind of double exposure and discoverability there. Okay, final two slides um, from, from my conference a couple of weeks ago. One of the, I think, misconceptions about Creative Commons licenses that you see is that somehow they encourage plagiarism. I think the only answer to plagiarism is write your book and then put it in the box and then sellotape it up so no one can read it. <laughs> I don't think that's why most people write. <laughs> Certainly not why I write, for no one to read it. Um, you know, plagiarism sits out from copyright. It's an ethical issue, and I think it's very clear that, that, that people understand that. You can plagiarise in copyright material out of copyright material, but essentially you can only plagiarise material that you can discover. And I think um, everyone is, is writing for their material to be, to be discovered. That isn't a picture of the universe, that's a picture of the, well maybe it is, it's the digital universe, it's the internet. Um, and I think it's really important that people start to think about impact and how um, people, how, how impact, the impact of scholarly information is, is changing. You know, it isn't just, um, as we see in the journal world, impact factor. Now, um, companies like Impact Story there are running businesses on, um, for publishers, but also importantly for funders to say, okay, you know, what is the impact of this article, this monograph that I have funded, you know, 300 copies go into, going into the libraries is one sort of impact, but actually with the open web, with tools like text and data mining, um, you, can, you can measure impact in different ways. And, and clearly with open forms of licensing um, of, of content, 
the way that your the material that the author creates and writes because it's discoverable on the open web allows us to measure impact through social media and and other other methods of dissemination very very differently and this this company called impact story gave a really interesting presentation um, saying that the day before they'd been in Washington DC talking with the um, National Institute of Health they're the Department of Health in the US and they were really interested in what impact story were doing because for them it really showed how in the public arena away from scholarly communications but on the open web for citizens what the impact potentially of material funded by NH NIH was. So I would implore you to think about discoverability and, and the way that impact is, can, and will be measured. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jocelyn. So I've been asked to talk about Creative Commons uh, generally and also to address some of the key things that have been discussed and thrown up by consultations and debate recently. So that's basically what I'm aiming to cover. Hopefully we won't run out of time. So we're going to have a, a brief overview of Creative Commons. I appreciate a lot of you are quite familiar with it already. Uh, talking to a few people at lunchtime, some of you aren't. So I am going to give a, an overview of it and then kind of move on to discuss four key areas I've kind of come across in reading what's been sort of submitted in the consultations, what's been written about, what's been spoken about. And the four areas that I've kind of identified that there are concerns around uh, in relation to Creative Commons licensing and open access um, in HSS are to do with things like attribution, how attribution works, getting credit where credit's due, um, the integrity of the work, or you know, what is the fear, what is the concerns about putting your work with a Creative Commons license out there on the, on the web, for instance, and how do you make sure that it's not used in a, in, a, in a way, in a fashion that you're not happy with, in a disparaging way, for instance? And then thirdly, the issue about third-party content. You know, if you're going to be integrating third-party content into your own work that you may license with a Creative Commons license, how do you get clearance? What are the issues there? How can you make sure that you're protected from any client claims by a third party? And lastly, this issue about commercial use, you know, whether it's desired, what does it mean? Um, should, you, should you be using a license which kind of uh, prevents other people making money out of your own content? So those are the kind of four key areas we'll hopefully move on to discuss after the overview. Okay, so what is it then? Well, Creative Commons is, uh, is a non-profit organisation that have been around a long time. So it's not a sort of new fad, hippie organisation. They're well established uh, in the US, um, Nonprofit, and what basically their remit is to provide free copyright licenses. So they are copyright licenses, just like any other, as Ben said, and you can attach them to works that you own copyright to. So whoever you are, you've got whatever you've created has copyright, you can put a Creative Commons license on it. And basically it just spells out for other people that come across that content that's licensed what they can do with it legally. What can they do with it? So the aim of the Creative Commons organisation when they formed all those years ago was really to allow people to communicate how they want their work to be shared. Because not everybody wants to lock their work down in all rights reserved copyright. You know, people on lots of occasions want other people to reuse it, to share it, to remix it, do wonderful things with it. Um, and they wanted to make that easier for people to put by providing these simple licenses. So their aim was to sort of go from the all rights reserved situation that you've got automatically with copyright that Ben refers to as well, to this some rights reserved. So really the, the message I always sort of hammer at home really about Creative Commons licenses, it's about choice. You know, you exercise your copyright according to what your particular aims may be in relation to that piece of work. Uh, and you've got a choice of different licenses. So exercise your copyright as you want it rather than how copyright dictates. That's basically what Creative Commons is. So even though they started in the US, it's kind of spread globally and it's in different jurisdictions, including the UK. And I was involved with the UK team of affiliates for a number of years. Um, 
and, that, and that's why Karen approached me to come and speak about Creative Commons here. So basically, set of licenses, free, user all, all over the world, as Ben referred to, this, you know, this, uh, half a billion works, a lot of it you would have come across if you use the web. I think it's also important to say what Creative Commons isn't. Um, th there is a lot written about Creative Commons. You know, it's like, it like events already referred to, it, but it encourages plagiarism, it encourages piracy. Um, it, it, it's not that at all. I think people who are familiar with it, familiar with the licenses, know that it's a copyright license. It's built on top of copyright. And if copyright didn't exist, then obviously Creative Commons wouldn't be needed either. <coughs> But it is important to also recognise that it's not a, a copyright enforcement body. So if you use Creative Commons licences to, uh, to attach that licence to your work and there is infringement, in, uh, you know, somebody has used it in contravention of the terms of the licence, Creative Commons is not a, a legal enforcement body that you can go to and they can fight your case for you. And they like to make that quite clear um, when they communicate what their role is. So it's not legal services, it's not a legal enforcement organisation. And it doesn't store like a big database of CC licence content either. You go and get your licence from the site, yes, but they don't actually keep track of who's, who's licensed what and when. Okay, so that's what it isn't. So there are six licences. So I'm just going to run through very briefly the different ingredients, if you like, that go into the six different licences. There's four core sort of ingredients that go into the different licenses. The six licenses are there on that kind of scale. So on the left-hand side there, you've got all rights reserved copyright. And on the right-hand side there, PD referring to public domain, where either the copyright is expired, it's run out the time that we, you know, we're referring to as run out, or someone has chosen to state, articulate that they are not interested in retaining their copyright. So they may use one of the Creative Commons tools, which I haven't put up there. It's not a license, it's a tool where you can actually communicate that you're not interested in retaining your copyright. So some people use the tool CZ0 to articulate that. I know Cameron Nayland does on his blog, he uses CZ0 to say that that's, that's his intentions towards the copyright of his blog. So let's have a look at the ingredients then. Attribution, the much talked about attribution, CC attribution is a license which has this component. All six licenses of the CC suite of licenses have attribution. And basically what it means is that if somebody reuses the work that is licensed with a Creative Commons license, they have to give you credit. They have to give you attribution. And they have to give you attribution as they usually do dictate or as they prefer. So you can dictate how you prefer. And if it's reasonable for the reuser to do so, they should attribute as you've sort of indicated as your preference. So attribution across all six licenses, it's a requirement. Second component is the share alike component. And what, how this works is that if, you've got a, if you take content that has been licensed with a share alike license, and you build on it, you remix it, or you repurpose it in some way, you adapt it in some way, your adapted work also has to be released under the same license. You have to share it back under the same terms of the license. So if you adapt to a piece of work that is licensed with share alike, you also have to share alike. So that's quite important for some people who don't want their work to be reused and then locked up with a more uh, restrictive license. They want the license to say, well, my work, when it goes forward in the adapted work, should stay as free as my original work was. So Wikipedia, for instance, uses the CC BY share alike licenses. So if you adapt Wikipedia content, then you should license it under the same license. So that's the second component. Thirdly, the no derivatives <coughs> license. So basically, you can use the content on a, a license where it says no derivatives, but you can't do any adaptations to it. You can only use it as it is. Now, that is quite restrictive. Um, and as an educator, as a, as a tutor, as an academic, that may go against what your intentions are. Whenever I talk about sort of licensing, Creative Commons license, I always kind of get people to think, well, what's your intention? What's your aim in thinking about this license? What do you want to happen to your content? And if it is that you want people to share it and learn from it and maybe translate it, then no derivatives license may not be the right license to go for. 
but it, it, it is attractive to some people where they want that control. They don't want people to translate it and remix it, but it is a very restrictive license. And the last component is the non-commercial component. Okay, so basically, if you license something with a non-commercial license, you are allowing people to reuse the content, but you don't want others to make money from it. Now, this, is, this again, is a much discussed component because questions that are thrown up as to what does non-commercial mean? Who, we are, is a university a non-commercial entity? Is it the entity or is it the use that we should be focusing on? So we'll come back to that. So th those are the four ingredients that go into one or more of the licenses. You've got the six licenses. So you've got the choice. As a creator, as an author, you have a choice as to which license. Now, the CC BY license is the much discussed license, I think, in open access recently in a lot of the debates. We'll come back onto that in a minute. But I just want to say also, I think Ben referred to the, the sort of the machine readable aspect of Creative Commons license. So I won't repeat that, but I'll just sort of remind us why it's important that CC license do allow you to be discovered on the web. You know, we're talking about digital content. We, that came up a lot in this morning's discussions. So it is important to realize that, but it's also important to mark up your content properly when you go and get a license because you have got those three layers, including the machine readable, the, the metadata, the code aspect of it, which you should mark up when you go and get the license. So what you see bef before you there is the actual license tool. So you go to the Creative Commons license chooser and you answer a couple of questions. And again, going back to what I said just a couple of minutes ago, it's about what you want to permit, what, what your choices are uh, in order to get the license. And at the bottom left-hand corner there, help others to attribute you. Well, this is the bit that you do need to pay attention to, I think. A lot of people forego that bit thinking, I don't really need to bother with that. But that is really important. I see a lot of content where, you know, well-intending people kind of say on their blog or say on their... Uh, website saying, uh, yeah, this is Creative Commons license CC BY or CC BY non-commercial, but it's not actually marked up properly, which means it hasn't got the HTML there. It doesn't link back to the actual license. It's just text. So the intention is there, but it doesn't really give enough information to people who come along and discover that content as to what they can do with it. Google won't pick it up if you haven't marked it up properly. So it's important to get that HTML. And if it is digital content, put it on there so you can get discovered. Because otherwise you'd be losing out on Google love. You're not getting discovered, um, as I think most, most people want to be online. So that's, that's basically the license chooser. So give enough information, and you can specify how you want to be attributed, who you want to be attributed. So in an open access kind of HSS situation, it may not just be the author who wants to be attributed. You may want yourself as the copyright owner, because what usually happens with CC being used in open access publishing is the author, the researcher, retains the copyright and uses the CC license, but you may want the publisher to be attributed as well. You may want the funder to be attributed as well. So that's just an example I made up. So the, you know, the learned ac academic published by so-and-so publisher, funded by a particular trust. So all of them get the credit because they've all contributed to that piece of work. So you can word your attribution so that everybody gets the credit. And if it is a work that's based on another piece of work, you can say what it's based on and link it back. So this particular slide kind of relates to two of the issues that I mentioned that is areas of concern. So attribution, how you make sure you get attributed properly, and also to make sure that there is, you know, the integrity of your work is protected in some way. So attribution, you can specify how you want to be attributed, who you want to be attributed, where you want to be attributed. You can ask that your original work be linked back to, so that if you're worried about, oh, you know, Jocelyn's going to take my work and make a real hash of it, I don't want any association with it, you can ask that I link back to your original work so people can see, well, that was really good, this is the 
you know, rework of it, which isn't as good. So your in the integrity of the work is preserved. So I think attention, more attention, a little bit of effort on that makes a lot of difference as to achieving the credit that you're due as the copyright owner and the other parties, if that's what you choose as the copyright owner. Okay, so that's attribution and marking your work up properly. I think it's really important. Again, the, the first point, I think Ben's already covered it in terms of plagiarism. Yeah, it is an independent thing. You know, anybody can pass off work. And if you put your work out there, it will happen to a lesser or a greater degree. Um, and, you know, there is no way of 100% proofing that. Whatever license you use, if you go and use a commercial license or they use the CC license, if it's out there, people are going to see it and therefore minority will do stuff with it that you may not have actually given permission to do. The second point, which again is a concern for people, is that somebody might come and take my work that I've CC licensed and they may imply I've somehow endorsed it or I support it or I'm some way connected with it. Well, Creative Commons recognises this as a concern and actually is in the terms of the license that there is no endorsement, there is no sponsorship implied. So if somebody is doing that, if somebody is implying that, they are in breach of that term of the license. So, you know, you are protected as you can be by legal terms uh, in, in, in that. And similarly with um, unfavourable remixing, you can actually ask people to not attribute you. So if you've come across something that's been rehashed, a piece of your work, and it's absolutely dismal or it's actually associated with a cause that you really disapprove of, you can ask that you don't be attributed because that's part of your moral rights. Your moral rights are not affected by the CC licenses. It's, it's reserved. So you can ask that it, you be not attributed. So that's important to remember as well. And you can re require the link back to your original work always. So that travels with any re remixes of your work. So your original work is not kind of denigrated anyway. It's preserved. The last point I would uh, is make, it's not really a CC point, but I think it's a point that kind of highlights these kind of concerns aren't unique uh, to, to yourselves as a, as a community. The UK government introduced the Open Government Licence back in 2010. I don't know how aware you might be there. So the Open Government Licence actually allows uh, licensed a lot of government content with an Open Government Licence, which is mirrored very closely on the Creative Commons Attribution Licence, CC BY Licence. So sites like HMRC, that is Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, ACAS, which is the employment advisory body, uh, GovUK, like business link content, all contain very kind of regulatory, I mean, they can't call it advice, but regulatory information. You know, how to form companies, how to pass resolutions as directors to wind down your company, what sort of tax applies to you as a company. These are very kind of regulatory thing, and you, obviously the government were worried. People are going to take that distorted, be out of date, they'll do all sorts of weird and wonderful things with it. They were concerned about that, but they overcame that fear because of the terms of the license protected them sufficiently. So uh, the message there really is if the government, who is probably the most cautious entity you can think of, is able to overcome that fear and go with an open government license that is mirrored on CC BY, I think, you know, if you get the terms of the license, if you familiarise yourself with the CC BY, you may think, well, yeah, that is enough protection or that is as much protection I can get if I'm going to put my content out there. So that's the only reason I've put the, the OGL in there. Okay, the other aspect of it was to do with third-party content. You know, how do you have content where you've got your CC license content and you've got third-party content that might be Creative Commons or it may be a different type of Creative Commons license content? How do you make sure it all sits okay and nobody's going to be kind of full foul of copyright law? Well, Wired UK, the reason I've got Wired UK is that they, they sometimes use Creative Commons license content on their site. They did a really good feature on the 10th anniversary of Creative Commons where they released some of their articles under Creative Commons license. But obviously Wired is all rights reserved copyright publication generally. 
So the point is that you can do both. You can, by clearly marking, clearly demarcating the different types of license content, all rights reserve content with CC license content, to make sure that you know, the reuser understands what they can do in relation to third-party content. So it's a question of you having a... If you are negotiating clearance with third-party uh, content owners, it's a, it's a case of maybe negotiating that and say, I can, we can do this properly so that your rights are preserved and I can CC license it as well. So and that's what Creative Commons recommends. You know, the, the copyright, clear copyright notices can alleviate that. Uh, or limit that risk. Because other organisations, sometimes Guardian uses images that are CC licensed, BBC have, and you know, there's, there's even been situations where BBC haven't correctly attributed and the CC community on Twitter go berserk and suddenly they, they do attribute properly. So that happens. So it's important to note that you can do the mixing, but it's a question of negotiating the clearance. Lastly, um, permitting commercial use. Now, talking to people about open access and HSS, you know, there is a kind of a sort of a leaning towards commercial, you know, preserving a commercial, uh, using a non-commercial license. And when I started to ask, well, why is that? Do people intend to, you know, make money out of it themselves? Does a lot of money get made from publications in the future? And the kind of the feedback tended to be, well, no, it's not really about the money. It's to do with the control, not losing control, uh, so that you know by not allowing other people to make money of it, you, people feel that they're in more control of the content. But again, I think you've got to go back to what are you trying to achieve? What is the aim of what you're trying to do by putting your content out there with an appropriate license? Are you going to make lots of money out of it? What is the gain overall for other people are allowed to make money out of it? And then think about what, you know, what does non-commercial mean? You know, increasingly, it's uncertain as to whether universities are commercial or non-commercial. By having a non-commercial license, are you going to be preventing other universities from using your, your content that's CC licensed with a non-commercial license? Possibly. So it's important to realise sort of what are you trying to achieve and not use non-commercial license as a way of controlling your work, I think. So, in conclusion, I would say CC offers choice. You know, there's a different range of licenses. I know CC BY is talked about a lot, and there's lots of benefits that I think we've covered in different sessions as to why CC BY might be appropriate. Funders have the choice as to what sort of conditions they attach to the funding that they're going to be distributing um, to researchers. And authors choose to accept the terms of that funding. And if the terms of that funding or the conditions to touch that funding is a particular license, then it's, it, you, know, it, you have to negotiate that or you have to understand what, what is it that I'm trying to achieve and does this license suit my needs. CC licenses are well established globally and it's recognised globally. You know, where it has been challenged in the courts, it's legally robust. It hasn't been shown to be some bad license or an inferior license. It stands up in court. And they are just copyright licenses. So it enables frictionless sharing while requiring attribution in every license. So that's, that's why we think, I mean, my background is a legal background, but at the moment I'm working on a startup which concentrates on attribution. And what you see there is an attribution graph where people are being attributed. So you may recognise some of the, the names there. So what I've done there is, is that's just a filtered content of people writing about open access or being featured in open access. So uh, there's Knowledge and Latch there, there's Karen Malloy there. So there's just a filtered bit, bit, a graph based on attribution. So that's what we're working on at the moment at Zilpa. And attribution is important, so I empathise with the need for attribution and re a correct attribution. I think the alternative might be that you know, you're know you going to be out there well protected, but you're not going to be maybe out there enough, You know that people don't know enough about what you're doing and what great things you're doing. So that might be w worth bearing in mind. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Ben and Jocelyn. Um, I think um, what we could do is to take a, um, a quick round of questions and then ask uh, Ben and uh, J Jocelyn to address them as a set before we, we move on. I thought that was an invaluable briefing session on some of the issues for all of us that lie behind any debate on one open <coughs> access, whether from on grass or elsewhere. Anybody want to come in? Any points of clarification? Go ahead. Margot Berger from University Press in Göttingen. Um, we had a meeting of our editorial board and we are a dedicated open access publisher for my university and our editorial board, Sandy was bringing up all these misconceptions we almost wanted to lay down and cry. <laughs> and the question is, um, how do you get this idea that research integrity is actually protecting research much more than a license? How do you get it across when it comes to open access? Because obviously authors and editors and scholars seem to have these misconceptions about plagiarism and, hmm. well. <laughs> so the, the question is, is are we, do we need new strategies to put into people's hmm. heads that research integrity is a protection for yeah, scholarly yeah. work? Thank you. That's good. Hold on to that one. Let's take another couple of uh, couple of points. If anybody wants to come in, anybody else? Yes. Yeah, we can. The most restrictive form of Creative Commons license, and then if they became more comfortable. Relinquishing control. So okay. how much choice do they have in that regard? Good question. Thank you. It's got another one. Anybody? Uh, two more. One at the back and one here. And then we'll, then we'll move, move on. That's right. There we go. And then one at the back after that. Go ahead. Jill Russell from the University of Birmingham. Um, ben rightly said that authors, um, as when they're employed, sometimes have to transfer their rights to their employers. Um, the requirement from the funding councils that authors use a particular license on some of their publications, is that because the relationship is the same as that employer-employee relationship? Could you perhaps clarify okay. that? Thank, Thank you. you. And then to the back, and then right back, here we go. And then we'll, 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 we'll have some answers to those four questions. Please go ahead. Hello, Jenny Boyle, Warburg Institute. Just a short question, should publishers be dictating the kind of CC license that their author should choose. That's Thank you. <laughs> got that one. Right, Jen, Ben, Justin. You've got to answer all of these questions now. <laughs> Free legal advice. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, research integrity. I, th I, I, th I do think that studies might be very useful. Um, there's somebody in the audience who I won't name who used to work for a very, very large um, open access publisher who's published uh, open access for many, many years in the science sphere. And they said that they've never had a problem with plagiarism or complaints or et cetera, et cetera, in terms of reuse of work. So I do... Th <laughs> <laughs> that person knows who they are, so yes. <laughs> if they let me say who they are, that'd be fine. Um, but I do think studies is... is um, Sitting on the platform, a very good way of going. Jocelyn, you said. Right. The second question was, um, can you start with a restrictive uh, license and move on to a different, more lenient license or more permissive license? Well, Creative Commons licenses aren't, uh, are non-revocable, meaning that you can't change your mind. You can't pull the license from underneath someone who's already exercised their rights under it. So if I come across your content and your content is under a particular license and I reuse it, that, I'm bound by that. But you can change your mind and re-license content, and that would affect people that come across it subsequently. The problem is, of course, when you put it on the web, it's out there, and you don't really know how far it may travel. So it may go and it may um, affect a lot more people that you may have intended. But going back to your question, it does happen where people kind of experiment with a restrictive license first. And when they feel a, a little bit more at ease with Creative Commons, gain more confidence with Creative Commons and how the licenses work, they may in future license with a more permissive license. 
So they do experiment that way. But it's important to remember it's non-revocable against people who may have already exercised their rights under it. Does that make sense? <laughs> Um, question three about the funding councils. Is that relationship the same as the employer-employee relationship? Um, no, it's a different relationship. UK law, other than sound recordings, for reasons that I won't go into, um, essentially the copyright of the employee belongs to the employer. I think essentially universities are very liberal in the way that they treat their employees. Um, aren't you lucky academics, yeah, close brackets? You don't realise it, but you are. <laughs> um, funding councils, that's a contractual relationship, i.e. as a, in return for the funding, we as funder require certain things. So that's, that's the difference in the relationship. It's employee-employer as opposed to via contract from, from the funder. And then question four, leading question, should publishers di dictate the licence? I would say that um, you, you can think about this as having at least three different players. You have the funder, you have the author, and you have the publisher. Um, you might argue that there are different balances of power there, but if the funder, the author, and, and, and the publisher were equally educated and knew how licensing worked, then I think you could have a kind of a mature relationship. Um, <laughs> I would say that the, the funder has the upper hand because essentially, you know, it, the work kind of comes from, from what is being funded. So the funder definitely has the upper hand there. Good. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you.